And this chart shows how the probate court calculates their fee. It's based off of the gross estate on that estate tax return. It doesn't matter if you've had a full formal probate process and used their time an awful lot and had 16 hearings. It doesn't matter if you have a tax purposes only, zero probate assets, everything was in your trust and it was worth $10 million. These are the fees that are going to be calculated. And because the probate courts are significantly underfunded, this, this increased, what, two years ago? Big jump? Yeah, two years ago. Two years ago. The rules. And then they, there was no maximum for a while, and people went through the roof over that. So there is a maximum fee of $40,000 if you've got over $8,887,000 in gross assets. If you have zero to 500 bucks, you're paying $25 to the probate court. And then anywhere in between, there are different rules that apply if you've got assets that are passing to a surviving spouse because they figure they'll get you then. So you get a small reduction. If it's just you, this is, this is how we do the math. So um, we file that estate tax return, and you don't get anything from the probate court saying, great, good job, we love it. You get the bill from them, and that tells you, great, good job, they love it, you're good. You pay that probate court invoice. You've got either certification that the asset, if you've only filed the non-taxable estate tax return, you'll get a certificate from them verifying that the estate was under $2 million, so no estate tax was due. You pay the probate court fee, and what's important at this point is to make sure that we can get confirmation from the probate court that those things are taken care of, that we file on the land records, because if you've got real estate in Connecticut, Hank talked about that lien that doesn't show up anywhere. If you want to be able to sell that house either next week, next month, or 20 years down the road, you want to make sure that you've got clean title. If we don't do that now, when we're not selling the house till 20 years down the road, it's a whole lot harder to fix then. And, and keep in mind, I mean, I don't think this is the audience where you have to worry about this that much, but we certainly have seen situations where, you know, mom died 25 years ago, siblings thought everything was taken care of and suddenly discovered it wasn't. So a lot of these things, you know, you either deal with it now or you're going to deal with it much worse 30 years from now when it becomes time to sell mom's house. And then try and find the current executor who was dealing with it 30 years ago, who's really the only person who right now has authority to step in. Um, that's not fun. So don't leave that for your kids. Um, who is a Connecticut resident? Connecticut would really rather tax you than not. So if you're kind of half here and kind of half in Florida or kind of half in Massachusetts, talk to us about a legitimate change of residency and we'll send you a one or two pages of these are the steps that you really want to take to make sure that your residency is what you think it is so that you're not ending up paying excess taxes on your gross estate here as a Connecticut resident when really it may just be, I've got this house that I am here for a month out of the year and I really do live in Florida and this is how I can prove it. I buy my plane tickets from Florida, come home and go back to Florida, et cetera. Yes. Yeah. Speaking of out of state, mm -hmm. if at uh, maturity, I and my successors are out of state. Mm -hmm. The process is the same, only a lot over the telephone or? If you are completely out of state, and then you're going to be dealing with the probate process of whether you, wherever you are resident at that okay, point in time. As far as the, okay. the trust process would be the same. Trust. trust process would be the same. Yep, you're going to do exactly the same things because the trusts are largely governed by the terms of the trust document. And there's very little state law that applies to change anything that we've done. They would need to appeal, if you have any assets that did not get funded into your trust, then they would need to file an action in the probate district where you were resident at that point in time. If everything is funded, it would depend on the laws of the state where you live. Like, like Connecticut requires you to file this estate tax return, whether you're using the probate process or not. Not every state does. So that would be a state law dependent depending on where you live. In went. fact, to the best of my knowledge, that's unique to Connecticut, having to file, okay? In, 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 yes, it, it's, it's a it. tax by a different name. It's if a tax, it's a fee. <laughs> Rose. So it depends on where you go and how your assets are titled. So I, I, I think we're kind of beating this into the ground a little bit. Um, if you have that zero to fifty dollars, you're still filing that Connecticut estate tax return and you're paying your twenty-five dollar fee and, and moving on from there. If your taxable estate is over two million dollars, you're filing a very different income tax return that goes to the Department of Revenue that does get reviewed and that you will want to get tax clearance on. You'll file a copy with the probate court, but this is, this is where you really want to make sure that you've gotten those appraisals done for those items of personal property. Um, they're not going to just accept a, 
I think it's worth about, my wild guess estimate was, um, probate court fees, I, although they can be significant for particular items, $1,000, $2,000, the difference in the probate court fee is maybe 10 bucks. So they're not gonna nickel and dime you on those kinds of things. But when you're talking about, you're, now you're paying taxes on top of that probate court fee, you wanna make sure you're careful with everything that you've done. And again, this is all assets. Unless you've made significant changes to get them out of your taxable estate, we're talking about everything in your trust, in your, in your probate estate, your jointly owned, your beneficiary designations. And this, so this will show you an idea of where your estate taxes could be. If you're under the $2 million, zero estate tax, only the probate court fees. And then starting at $2 million, you, your tax starts at 7.2%, and then it gradually goes up by brackets to 12%. So if you're at the over $10,100,001, you're talking $748,200 plus 12% of the excess over, and that will just keep on going. And then anybody else would fall somewhere in between. We've got six months to file this estate tax return after your date of death. We can get an extension if need be. We don't always have absolutely everything that we need within those six months, but we want to make sure we get that tax paid pretty promptly as well because nobody wants to pay interest on top of it. Richard. In Connecticut, these rates of the Connecticut <clears throat> estate tax compared to other neighboring states like maybe no, maybe not Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York State, I think it's higher. Ours is higher than Massachusetts. Our, our uh, exemption is higher than Ma Mass and Rhode Mass, Island. Uh, Massachusetts is a million dollar threshold. But the rates, I don't know. The, the rates in Mass are higher than they are here. Mass caps at 16%. Rhode Island, uh, they've recently changed their statute. Their, their threshold used to be 675. It was 875 last I knew, but it's grading up. New York is, it will ultimately, be, it's grading up currently, I don't know where it is in the grade, but in the next year or two, it will be at, at five and a half million. Uh, so, but don't assume that this is what the law is gonna be when you get there, because they keep changing the rules. And okay. if you're going to die in New York, please crawl over the Connecticut border, because the Connecticut please. probate courts are what they are, but they are reasonable to deal with. Jeff, how's New York? Oh. <laughs> My day if you was want going a problem. Fine, then, no, it really, you know, when people talk about how easy or hard the probate courts are to deal with, I'd say you've got Connecticut is a breath of fresh air compared to Massachusetts, and Massachusetts is smooth sailing compared to New York. Yeah. They don't call it the Empire State for a reason. And I will say this, I mean, it takes, the process takes longer if you have to go through probate, but the, by and large, the probate court clerks and judges in Connecticut just want to make sure that what is supposed to happen actually happens. And they will, there's only so much advice and help that they can give you, but they will try because they're not interested in dragging these things on and clogging up their courts any more than you and I are interested in dragging these things on and clogging up their courts. Um, so, yep, for Massachusetts, You've got the million dollar exemption, where in Connecticut it's two million that you can have before you have to file that estate tax return and pay estate taxes. The Massachusetts estate tax return has a really funky system that works off of a very old federal. Jeff loves doing them. That's all you guys need to know, unless you really want to do Massachusetts estate tax return. We'll talk it, at that is, point in time. It is truly bizarre. You file about a 60 pages worth, where really there's three pages of real information. So we'll help with that. Carol, you had a question. What do they do? I know you said kind of do a six months after death one. When is that? Nine. Nine. Nine months after date of death. And you, there's always an, an extension available, a one time. But if you're, you, know, you go on beyond that, now you're talking about interest and penalties that start accruing, and nobody wants to be in that boat. Um, federal estate tax, if you've got an estate taxable of over almost five and a half million dollars, now you're filing your federal estate tax return. And that estate tax, that's going to be a hefty estate tax that you're going to pay. The annual gift exemption where you don't have to file a gift tax return that applies against that lifetime exclusion amount is $14,000. You've got nine months from date of death to file your federal estate tax return. And there are times you might want to file one even if you're not required to. If you're the surviving spouse, and depending on how your assets were divided up at first, you may have... We'll kill off the husband first, that's pretty much our go-to. Dies with $3 million of assets. Could have had 5,490, 
So you've got 2490 of an unused exemption that can be ported over to the surviving spouse who may have five million of her own, six million of her own, could use a little bit extra. So we'll file a return just for the portability purposes. We'll talk about that for anybody that that applies to, we'll talk about at that point in time, but it's an option that's available to make sure that married couples get the full value of the almost $11,000. And keep in mind with these numbers, it's, it's a much smaller portion of our clients need to worry about federal estate taxes, but there's still plenty of clients that should worry more about state estate tax issues among these various states. So you don't, it doesn't always get the sort of the glamour and the worry about the, the federal level, but the math is there. And a couple with more than $2 million in assets is going to want to consider doing some kind of planning to make sure that you get the full $4 million per couple exemption. And for those of you who own property in Massachusetts? <laughs> Sell it. <laughs> well, a actually, we can solve the problem in Mass. Okay, there's planning that can be done to make it go away. But if, if you own real estate, if you inherit a piece of real estate in Massachusetts, and you're really a Connecticut resident, <laughs> there's absolutely no reason to pay mass estate taxes. And if we don't know about it, we can't advise you on the planning you can do to make that tax go away. Because mass, you got, a, you, got a, you got two million in Connecticut, you, got a, you inherit a house out on the Cape that we don't know about, you're going to pay tax on the full value of that place on the Cape even though you don't have a million dollars in Massachusetts. Again, what we were just talking about as well is if you know that you've got an estate where there may be some tax issues of any sort, we try and build flexibility into our trust-based plans so we can look at the tax laws at the time the first spouse dies and make sure that we're funding sub-trusts appropriately to minimize taxes. And we're going to look at income taxes and we're going to look at estate taxes because there's always a competing co consideration. To pay. We can't solve 100% of all, all tax issues if you've got both. But we can look at minimizing the taxes and maximizing the benefit to your heirs. So most of you will have what we call this Clayton election built into your trust that lets us take a look at the tax situation at the time of the first death and make the allocations that are most appropriate. If it has been years and years and years since you've come in to update the documents, even though every January we send you a letter saying, hey, you know what, it's been a couple years, there are some changes that we want you to take care of, this is one of them. Um, you want that in there so that you can take that second look when, when it matters. So we've gotten our estate tax return, we filed that, it's been approved, you've paid the bill, we've gotten the liens released on any real estate, you've already collected all of the assets, you've consolidated them, you've paid the bills, you filed your return of claims. It's time for you to do the accounting. And that is the annual accounting to the trustee, to, from the trustee to the beneficiaries of the trust can be as simple as, here's a copy of the tax return that we just filed. You can also do a full accounting if you want to engage us or a CPA to do an accounting of everything that came in and went out. And then the probate court can be called in to deal with any issues, questions, problems that a beneficiary may have, but by and large, unless somebody's got an issue or a concern, the probate court is not going to get involved in your trust administration. For probate, if you're, for any reason your estate is dragging on for more than a year, you're going to file something periodic, you're going to file something interim, you're going to tell them why, you're going to tell them where you're at. For the most part, for clients that have, like yourselves that are in our program, we know what everything is and we've been able to access it quickly. We'll be doing a final accounting with the, within a year of the appointment of the executor and that's going to be what came in what we started with, what we added to it, what we took away from it, what's left, who it's going to under the terms of the will, and what we have left. So, and what we have left may be a teeny tiny reserve, or it may be, you know, we've gotten everything done, we've done our tax returns, we've paid our taxes, every, we know that we've gotten everything taken care of, we're going to distribute everything out, we're going to get that account down to zero. If we're filing an account that says we're keeping a $5,000 reserve for tax returns, at some point we're going to have to file yet one more accounting to say this is what we did with the 5000 we file that, we get the probate court approval to make those distributions that we talked about, and then we'll file what's called an affidavit of closing estate saying, we, we, said, we did what we said we were going to do and we're done. And again, this is one of those items where you don't really get closure from the probate court. You file it, they close the file, you don't get a letter saying you're done, congratulations. You get one from me saying you're done, congratulations, and you say thank you, but um, probate court, you tell them that you're finished and they'll, they're going to take your word for that. 
So once you've gotten the permission, before you file that closing affidavit, you're going to make those distributions that we talked about. So you're going to look at the terms of the trust. If there are specific distributions, you may have made those by now. If it's $10,000 to each of the grandkids and the trust has $500,000, you're not going to wait until this point to send out those checks to the grandkids. If it's you know, something substantially larger, we're going to tell you, hold off until we're sure we've got liquidity. So we'll take care of any specific distributions. The personal property at this point in time, if it was, you know, my diamond ring should go to my daughter Karen, that should have been done by now too because as trustee, those are the kinds of things you want to distribute out as quickly as possible so you don't have the ongoing liability for them as well. Um, so then the remainder can be distributed outright, could be held in a subtrust. For most of you here, it's probably in a subtrust that we will then help you fund. It'll have its own tax ID number. It'll be responsible for filing its own income tax returns and we'll give you some instruction on that. And we may be talking about who the trustee is going to be of that because mom and dad might have decided that oldest daughter Karen should be trustee for everybody's trust. And Karen's like, oh, I don't think so because Bob over there is never going to listen to what I want to say. Um, so we'll, we'll work with you on making sure that we get those things set up. If it's outright, you'll be writing checks outright. For probate, you'll deal with any specific bequests. You'll make the distributions as under the terms of the will and then you get certificates of device for real estate if need be. If you've got real estate that went through probate, you want to, you, all, anytime we're talking about real estate, we're talking about keeping clean title on the land records. Yeah, um, specific distributions and specific bequests mm -hmm. should be independent of the will. You can have them in the will or you can have them in the trust. If they're in the will, then It's probate asset. If they're in the will, those are the people who are going to hear about it at the very get-go. Once you satisfy those specific bequests, you don't have to tell them everything else that you're doing, necessarily. But we'd have to, we'd ask for permission to, you know, take them off the list of notifications. So if you, if you trust your successor to follow your um, directions, how would you provide for specific distributions of bequests that are not in your will? In your trust. You can do the in same thing trust. in your trust. In your Absolutely. In your trust. If you have and specific items that you are cert pretty certain you're going to hang on to for the long term and or ca certain cash distributions that you want to make, you can do that in your trust, especially if your trust is well funded. Your probate estate should be small compared to your trust estate because we're trying to make sure we're as fully funded as possible so you get that immediate authority, so you get the privacy, so that you can get things moving along a whole lot faster. So you can do a specific bequest in your trust. If, you want, if you're talking a little bit more in general, you all have, I would love to see somebody actually use this, you all have in your mind what we call a personal property memo. And that is a place where you can say, I want my dishes to go to my daughter Susan. I want my jewelry to go to my daughter Karen. I want my artwork collection to go to my son Joe. And you can fill this out. And it's not 100% legally binding, but if you're trusting your successor trustee to do what you want, and you give them instructions on what it is you would want, and they find this list, most people are going to want to do what you said. I have clients who come in and said, you know, mom said on her deathbed, I really want you, nobody wants the piano that's in my house. I'd really like it donated to the church. Didn't have time to put that in writing, but what do these kids want as soon as they come in? They want to give that piano to the church. And as long as everybody agrees, I will draft something that says, we all agree that this was not, you know, specifically legally documented, but if this is what you all want to do and nobody wants a piano in their house, because most people don't want those large items that maybe meant a whole lot to mom, but not to anybody else. So you have an option to put something in writing that is pretty much directory to your trustee or your executor. And again, we're going back to that tangible personal property where everybody is in agreement on what they want to do with it. And you've got a clue. Largely, that's going to happen without any probate court involvement. And you're just going to make that happen. So if, you know, if you've got 20, 30 different things that don't necessarily need to be specified in your trust. The $200,000 violin that's only going to one of your three children, specify that in your trust. Make that, you know, you don't make that kind of a problem for the kids coming after you. But, you know, the, the things just wandering around your house, who might want what? And again, communicate because maybe the kids want it, maybe they don't. You know, you never know who really loves what. Does that answer the question? Okay. So, a lot of times, we have a, a trust that would look like this. You've got client has come in, created their living trust. At the time that they pass away, their assets will be divided based on that Clayton election for tax purposes into a marital trust or a family trust. And then when the surviving spouse dies, you've got outright distributions that go to the kids. 
Now, we talked a whole lot about protecting assets and having to making sure that creditors and predators can't get to it. As soon as there's an outright distribution to the kids, who can get to it? If the kids can get to it, so can their creditors, so can their predators, so can divorcing spouses. Once it's in their pocket, it is fair game for everybody. So what we do for almost everybody in here is you've got your family trust and your marital trust that will be in existence during the lifetime of the surviving spouse. But then when the surviving spouse passes, we've got trust shares for the, ch for the children. And I think we had touched on this a little bit earlier. Maybe child one has a trust share with a liberal distribution standard. You know they're going to use it as they need to. They're not going to spend through it in a week and a half. Child three, same situation. They've got funds of their own. They're maybe a little older, a little bit better established. It's money that's there if they need it, but if it can, if it can sit there for a little bit longer, maybe get past the grandchildren, fantastic. Child number two maybe has some special needs. Maybe has a physical or cognitive disability that requires them to be on benefits to be able to get medical coverage and or they've got to live in a facility or maybe they've got addiction issues, maybe they've got gambling problems. You maybe want to set this up so that they don't have access to those assets quite so easily. And that's plain that we can do if you tell us that you've got that situation in your family. If we know about it, we can help you with it. If we don't know about it, you're giving money away to somebody that may <coughs> blow through it and or you're just donating money to the state. So we talked a little bit earlier about not taking control of property that we might want to send somewhere further. And that would be, we would do that by use of a disclaimer. You've got time limits that you need to, and a disclaimer is basically saying, I know this is supposed to come to me. No, thank you. I don't want it. And you're not directing it any further than that other than to say, not me. And then it will go to whoever the next named beneficiary or heir was. And there may be tax reasons for doing that. If you've got an income producing asset and it was originally going to go to mom, but mom's got sufficient assets otherwise, and maybe she's in a different tax bracket than whoever the next beneficiary is, for example. So you want to make sure that, that that goes that way. Or if we're going first to a trust and then to a spouse, it may be that the spouse would prefer to roll it over to her own IRA, get some better tax benefits on her death than would happen if it went into a trust on her behalf. So this is another chance we get to take a second look at the planning that you've done based on the circumstances that are occurring while, when the first spouse dies so that we can make sure that we get everything where it would be, where you would want it to be had you been here to help us figure that out right now. So, family discussion guide. What are, what's the key for today? The key takeaway is talk to people about what you want. Let them know. You don't have to let them know everything that you have, but you need to at least have it in a place where somebody knows what you have and can find it. You don't necessarily have to tell all of your kids and your grandkids your, your net worth down to the penny. I get that. But making sure that you have a trust or a will that suits your needs now. If you've done it three, four, five, six years ago, you might want to take another look at it and say, does this do what I want? What does it do? Do I even remember or did I take it home, put it on a shelf and not look at it again? Um, did you take the letters that we send you every January and put them in the binder and open it? Um, take a peek. It might surprise you what's in there. Sometimes you forget because not everybody talks about death and dying all day long like we do. <laughs> Probably most people don't, I would think. Um, have I funded my trusts? Jeff, another plug for the funding department? Yes. Got to fund your trust. <laughs> and I'm my... fun to work with. So. <laughs> you know, when we get to see you. Um, have my helpers agreed to serve? You might want to talk to the people that you've named. First, you want to think about the people that you've named after everything that we've gone over today and say, did I pick the best person for each job? Um, and they can be very, very different if we're talking about not just the estate settlement piece, but during disability, do you have somebody named to make healthcare decisions who will be empowered to make those decisions when the time comes? Or do you maybe need to think a little bit more about, am, am I asking too much of somebody that they just can't do, but I feel very strongly about what my wishes are? Um, do any helpers need to be changed? Once you've gone through this analysis, maybe you've got a couple name changes that you need. And if it's as simple as swapping out a name on a document, as Hank said at the very beginning, give us a call, let us know you need to change Jim to Joe, and there's no charge for that because you're LifeBridge members. Where can the trust and will be found? You've got your big green binder that's pretty easy to spot, but people need to know where that's at. And you've got the Secure Docs online, and you can tell as many or as few people about that access as, as you want to, but there are 
two places where at least copies can be found and where your originals are, and the original will is really the important piece. Um, have I inventoried my assets? Keep us up to date on that asset detail report. There's a tab in your binder for your assets. You can put the most recent statements you have from your accounts. You could put a handwritten list. You can, if you can just keep track somewhere centrally of everything that you own, the life insurance policies that people might not know about, the stocks and bonds that have been sitting there forever because nobody cashes them in until they, oh my gosh, I've got all these bonds. Um, making sure that we know what's out there so that we can make sure that it's all collected in a timely fashion and it doesn't go to waste. Um, I'm going to throw this out there because I heard this funny story just this week. If you've hidden piles of cash around your house and are in pockets of clothing, reconsider that plan because A, you've got beneficiaries who are like really dropping a bag off at of Goodwill. They're like, oh my gosh, the diamond ring, I think she just went and it, w it was here and it was gone. Um, I had a family who found up to of $10,000 in cash scattered around the house. Butter dish, rafters in the attic, down in the mason jars in the basement. That's not your best diversification plan. And none of our slides recommended that approach. And no, no, it's not on the personal property memo, you know, so make sure that we can find what you have. Um, because just throwing it in a hole in the basement and having nobody ever find it again, probably not what you intended to happen to it. And have I educated my helpers on how to administer my estate? If you're here, I am now preaching to the choir. If you brought somebody with you, you're doing the best you can to make sure that they're educated. And again, we are here all the time to answer questions. If you have questions about your plan, if you don't understand it, we want to know that. We want to help you understand it. If you want your helpers to understand it, let us know that. We want to make sure everybody is comfortable with what's going on so that, again, there are no surprises and people know what's expected of them. So, have your documents been reviewed for Connecticut estate tax? If, we, if you've been to see us recently, we've, we've talked to you about this. And any other state estate taxes, if you've gotten any property, if you've moved out of state or you've bought property out of state, we need to know about that. We want to, again, funding, funding, funding is your property titled correctly. If we send you an asset detail report and we've got all the accounts and we've got the amounts right but they're not owned the way we think they are, let us know then, and we can always, while you're alive and well, we can always fix that. Have we maximized tax and asset protection transfers? If we're doing any kind of transfers at all, we'll be talking with you about making sure we can minimize taxes. And like I said, you've got your income tax, you've got your estate tax, and they play against each other, but we'll look at that case by case. And to ensure the legacy that you're leaving is protected, that's, again, if you've got outright distributions of any sizable amounts, be sure that's what you really want to happen because I'm not going to tell you what to do with your money, but I'm going to tell you what will happen under different scenarios, and then you get to make an educated choice about, do I want to protect these assets for everybody who comes after me? Are your helpers willing and able to serve? Have you inventoried your assets? I, I, I'm not going to repeat all of this ad nauseum. Um, where your original trust and will are, and advisors coordinated as far as our office, your financial advisor, your CPA, we want to know that we can all talk to each other. It's a whole lot easier if, as professionals, we can cut you out of the middle for some of these things. Jeff, how much do you like doing funding when you've got an advisor who can take over? So much easier than giving you a whole bunch of forms to fill out. If we can coordinate with everybody else, or if we've got tax issues, we want to make sure that we've run a past your CPA who may be looking at things slightly differently than we are, or know something about you that we don't. So making sure that you've let us know, and we ask on our data form, Who's your CPA? Who's your financial advisor? Can we talk to them if we need to? Because we're always happy to. And if they have questions of us, we always want to be able to make sure that we're giving them the information that they need to do what they need to do as efficiently as possible.